Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, so I met Alex a couple of years ago at the single cell genomics meeting in um, Israel, in Tel Aviv, and which was like one of the best meetings I've ever been to. So I recommend it to anyone who's interested in single cell stuff. Um, and as I'm sure you'll see, the stuff he's doing just blew me away uh, in terms of uh, both uh, the physics, the biology, uh, the chemistry, etc. cetera. Um, so Alex um, did his undergrad at Columbia, um, did a PhD in chemical physics, um, now runs his own group uh, with all of these uh, affiliations you can see here. Um, and he's here under the auspices of several organizations. Uh, in particular, he's the ASI visiting speaker. So we thank ASI um, and other sponsors include uh, the Maligan Fluidime, who are doing a lot of single cell stuff, as you may know, um, and Millennium Science. Um, so thank you to the funders, the organizers. Thank you, Alex, for making your way all the way down south and uh, looking forward to hearing you speak. Thanks, Shailen. Uh, thanks, everybody. It's, uh, it's truly unbelievably cool to think that on the other side of the planet, there are people that actually care about the stuff that we do. Um, it's humbling and uh, a little bit fear-inspiring at the same point, so I'll try not to uh, disappoint. Uh, before I start, I just want to thank again all the organizers um, and sponsors who enabled this to actually be possible, and uh, Shailen, who told me that at some point, if I was ever on the side of the universe, that he would love to host me. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is some of the work that we've been doing over the past couple of years that sort of focused on trying to understand. All right, so uh, anyways, uh, going back to it, what I wanted to talk about today is some of the work that we've done over the past couple of years. It's focused on leveraging the natural variation that exists between seemingly identical cells or cells that we know to be different to try and gain a better understanding of how cells perform specific functions. Um, so as Shailen pointed out at the beginning, um, this is a, a talk for the ASI, but I am not an immunologist. I am uh, to do this at the beginning and give all caveats forward, a dumb physicist. So when I look at a biological system, I actually don't see a cell. I see a little black box with a function inside of it. And the question that I'm sort of trying to figure out is if I give a cell an input, it performs some function, generates an output, I want to understand what this function is and how it's actually structured. So I look at a cell that receives some sort of nutrient and secretes a hormone or receives a differentiation factor and becomes a different cell type. And all I really want to know is what are the molecules that are inside of this black box and how are they wired together? So the way in which I go about uh, doing this is as follows. I start off by perturbing my system. I then observe its response and I rip it apart and I look at all the different components that I can in the most thorough way possible. I then use this information to try and develop a model um, that tells me how I go from input to output. And because this is just a putative model, what we then do is we systematically iterate this process of perturb observe model until we reach a convergence solution. So this was something that I was actually doing in my PhD work. Uh, you know, I would do something like this. I, I developed a technique for doing perturbations in cells using nanowires. Uh, that's how I got into biology in the first place. Um, strange fate. Uh, but I was using uh, these perturbation techniques where I would take a set of cells, I'd add some perturbogen X, compare it to some control set, uh, lice my cells, do some genomic profiling, find genes that differed between them, and then we'd use integrative analyses to infer a network that was driving these differences. The problem is that when I was observing these things, um, I was making the assumption that actually all of the cells in this tube were the same and doing the same thing. Um, as I'm sure Shailen has told you, um, and people that were looking at it on the microscope can see, this is actually not the case. So if we look at, you know, dendritic cells responding to LPS, I'll talk about this more in a minute, we see tremendous differences in the expression of, uh, you know, different RNAs, even in identical cells and in the levels and activity of proteins. When we try and kill cancer cells by knocking out specific genes, sometimes we see that 50% die, but 50% survive. And if we look at, um, you know, differentiation of naive T cells, where we use a uniform stimulus on these cells, what we can see is that we actually get a tremendous amount of heterogeneity in our differentiation. So you know, 40% that become canonical TH17 here, and 60% that don't, and a tremendous amount of spread along this axis. So, uh, you know, it was, it's awesome to get all this data because it means that I got a PhD, um, which I'm sure for some of you is awesome, um, and you will get there. Um, and for those of you that had more successful careers, it's still awesome. Um, but, you know, in looking at all of this, there's a fundamental issue that I had here, which is that what I'm really telling you is that I had one input 
into one model, and I'm getting lots and lots of different outputs. So fundamentally, that doesn't make sense to me. If I have a model in physics, it should describe the input to output relationship very faithfully. And that's not what, not what I'm seeing here. So in thinking about it, you know, we sort of broke it down to, well, maybe these differences come from different sources. Maybe it's a technical issue, because maybe I just make bad measurements because I don't come from biology. It's possible. Um, you know, I could just be really bad at doing immunofluorescence or RNA fish. But there were other possibilities. It could be that actually these differences are biological. And if they're biological, it might actually be that they're structured. It might be that these cells are actually different. And so, you know, I was sort of interested in pursuing this hypothesis. And to put it back in the original framework that we had, what I'm really asking myself is, can we look at individual cells and treat these non-genetic vari variation almost like a perturbation? And by observing it, develop more faithful models for how cells actually perform basic functions. Uh, so what we're really asking, is this variability structured? And so in order to look at this, uh, during my postdoc, I turned to a uh, system that had actually had been well established in a V4GEVS group uh, at the Broad, and that's innate immune sensing by dendritic cells. Um, and I'm not an immunologist, so in a nutshell, I would just describe these, and probably everybody here knows better than I do, that these cells actually have receptors that respond to different pathogenic components by initiating um, immune response, or by initiating gene transcriptional programs that drive adaptive immune responses. But you know, even if we hit these cells with basically a bacterial Armageddon, so so much LPS that you couldn't imagine that they would ever think of doing anything else, you know, basically the equivalent of fire raining down from the sky, what we see is that there are tremendous differences in the activities and levels of proteins. And so you know, I wanted to understand if these cells right here, this one that makes this decision to have nuclear localization of IRF3 and a lot of expression, was actually different from this cell. And I was once told by uh, somebody that's much more famous than I am in the field that if I was worth my weight in gold or um, even in salt, I could figure out the 100 genes that were most important here and go and profile them. But I can't because I don't come from an immunology background. So to me, something that seemed like a very exciting opportunity in an emerging technology was to actually use single cell sequencing where we could go in and look at all of the RNA in the cells and pray that there'd be some pattern and some information in it that would tell us about why these cells were performing different functions. And so with this in mind, we generated uh, single cell sequencing libraries from 18 individual dendritic cells that we'd stimulated with LPS for four hours. And this is what the data looks like. And so it's obviously extremely noisy data. What I'm showing you are these histograms of reads across a number of different genes, uh, some of which are housekeeping, some are immune response, just sort of selected at random. At the bottom, I show you three population controls, which are 10,000 cells. And at the top, I show you two no-template controls where basically we didn't load anything in. So as an initial sanity check, what's good is that actually when we don't put anything in our tubes, we're not sequencing anything. Um, so what's happening here? Well, if we look at our gene expression profiles globally, what we can see is that actually technically we're doing a very good job. One population's gene expression estimates match those from the other population very faithfully which tells us that at least we know how to prepare these libraries um, and they're pretty reproducible. But if we look at our single cells, what we see is that there's actually a tremendous amount of heterogeneity. So some genes are very highly expressed in one cell but are completely off in the other and vice versa. Uh, but there are some genes that are consistently expressed. So maybe there's something interesting going on here. And there's an initial sanity check. If you just average together the 18, you can see that we start to get back the population. So what are the genes that are driving these patterns? Well, if we dive in and we look at these genes, what we can see is that the genes that are least variable across our cells are strongly enriched for ribosomal proteins and housekeeping genes. So this is exactly what you'd expect. Basically, all I'm telling you is that there are certain things that every cell needs, and they're expressing it. On the other hand, if we go to the other extreme and look at the genes that are most variable across all of our cells, what we see is that we have a strong enrichment for immune response. So, you know, basically, this is awesome. Because what this is telling me is that the genes that are the most variable are the ones that I want to study anyways. So really, I'm getting a window into all these different patterns, and I can look for information in it. You know, for example, I'm seeing that interferon beta is up a thousandfold in this cell versus this cell. The problem is just that, you know, before we go and we do any deep dives to see if there's structure, we have to convince ourselves that these patterns of variation are actually real. So you can't actually sequence a single cell, um, which I'm sure most people here know. Um, what you have to do is you have to take one cell, amplify it up into a million copies of itself, and then use that and treat it just like you would a population. So it's entirely possible that this difference right here could be a technical artifact. Maybe I lost the RNA in one cell. Maybe I overamplified it in another. 
And maybe that's what's driving these patterns. So we spent a lot of time trying to convince ourselves that this was actually real information. So uh, one way that we did this uh, was to turn to RNA fish, an orthogonal imaging-based technique. And so here I'm showing you the results for a couple genes. So here's B2M, which was expressed uniformly in all of our cells or highly in all of our cells. If we go and we do RNA fish, we see high levels of expression in most of our cells in something that's log normal on average. Whereas if we look at genes that were variable, like CXCL1, we see tremendous differences in our RNA sequencing, but we also see tremendous differences in our RNA fish. So here's a cell that has you know, thousands of RNA molecules represented as these individual points, and other cells that have absolutely none. And on average, it looks like a bimodal distribution. All right, so at this point, you know, what we convinced ourselves was that this insane idea of going in and sequencing the RNA from a single cell actually wasn't completely insane. We were going to be able to measure things that were actually biological instead of pure technical artifacts. But what we really wanted to know, thank you. Um, <laughs> what we really wanted to know was whether or not uh, there was actually structure in this. You know, do these differences between cells actually tell us something? And so I want to give you a couple brief examples just in the context of the 18 original cells before I scale up to hundreds or thousands, just to give you an idea of how we're going to be working with this data. So I'm going to tell you about what we were able to find in 18 cells looking at cell states, cell circuits, and even transcript structure. So starting at the first level. Um, so you have a bunch of variable genes. The first thing you might imagine doing is doing a principal component analysis. And that's what we did right here. Now, um, surprisingly, when we did this, we actually saw that three of our cells were very different than the rest. And the reason I say surprisingly is because I'd actually argued that we should do dendritic cells because I thought we'd get something that's more homogeneous. And the rationale had been that these cells were you know, post-mitotic. They um, were differentiated from bone marrow in this case. We were hitting them with this bacterial Armageddon. We could sort on the top 10% of CD11C. But yet, we found that these three cells were just jumping out. Um, so we convinced ourselves that these weren't a technical artifact um, by looking at a couple different metrics. And then finally, because we had sequencing data, we said, well, if they're real, there should be differences and we should be able to learn from that. So we go into our sequencing data, we find genes that define these three cells and genes that define this cluster. And from that, we were able to discover that these cells were actually a closely related maturity state. Um, so it turns out that if you pipe at these cells too aggressively when you culture them, they'll mature prematurely. Um, and that's what we're seeing here which you know, for truth in advertising kind of sucks because I thought it was gonna be the basis of a paper. We discovered a cell type, that's what everybody wants. But um, it's still cool to think that this technique is sensitive enough that we can distinguish closely related maturity states within a given population, all right? And this is important because I'm gonna come back to this idea later of finding groups and then finding markers and using those for subsequent study. So what about the variation that exists here? So I can't really see different groups of cells. The question is, you know, what is driving this? So instead of looking at a principal component analysis, if we look at covariation in expression um, and cluster it, what we see is we get these nice patterns. So here are two clusters that map very nicely to my first principal component. And those define these two maturity states that for lack of you know, creativity, we call maturing and cluster disrupted. Um, but what if this guy in the corner right here, this really nice cluster that maps nice to our second principal component? Well, if we look at the genes that are in there and look at the gene set enrichments, what we see is that there are a bunch of targets of interferon and these master transcription factors, STAT2 and IRF7. So this is cool because when we saw it, it actually proposed to us this interesting idea that maybe this correlation comes from upstream variable factors propagating downstream to targets. So you have a lot of IRF7 or STAT2 and that drives expression of a lot of these genes and that's where this correlation comes from. So with this in mind, we can develop a model and we can go about systematically testing it using perturbations like I said before. So normally we have a correlation um, in our single cell sequence, or this is in single cell qPCR across our genes. Um, squint a little bit, this is what correlations look like in single cell space, more on this in a second. We can test this by going in and perturbing one of our regulators with a knockout. And when we do, we can see that we can largely ablate this cluster. We see that this one gene, STAT2, remains expressed, which suggests that STAT2 may be upstream or in parallel of IRF7. We can go one step higher then and knock out the interferon receptor, and when we do, we validate this model. So this is a very simple toy example of what you can do. And for truth in advertising, this is the only circuit that we were able to tease out with 18 cells. But I want to at least put forward the idea that when you're using more cells and you have greater statistics, 
that what we're going to do is we're going to use correlation to infer causation and then systematically test it through perturbation strategies. All right, make sense? It dance anywhere? Yeah. I like that. I like interactive audiences. If it doesn't make sense, uh, yell at me and I will try and explain it better. Um, and so then the last thing that we discovered when we were doing sequencing, which actually we hadn't expected at all, was something having to do with structure. So when you sequence, you get both abundance and structure. So when we were looking at these mutually exclusive isoforms of Kalu, where we saw that we were getting alternative splicing at the population level, we saw something very curious in our single cells. And that's that sometimes you showed bias towards one isoform, and sometimes you saw it towards the other. Not in all cases, but it seemed like cells had a preference. Like, they're, like they you know, wanted one of these two isoforms or the other. And so this is really cool, hypothetically, because uh, it, it nominates some interesting questions about you know, cellular biology. But we weren't really sure if this was a technical artifact. Because you can imagine one isoform overamplified leads to you know, just one isoform being seen. So to convince ourselves that this is real, we did RNA fish on a couple different transcripts. So here we're looking at constitutive probes uh, for IRF7, and we can see that in cells where we have high expression of IRF7, we see a bias towards the inclusion or the exclusion of our cassette exon. And this is something that holds globally. So if we look at things that are alternatively spliced at the population level, either by being highly abundant or by having a number of UMIs, which means that we can detect that there are a number of unique molecules, we see that there's a bias towards the exclusion or the inclusion of our cassette. And so this is cool, and we've been using structural information for looking at things like BCRs and TCRs, um, but I won't talk about it much more. I'm just going to move forward. So this was relatively quick, but what I wanted to do as sort of a way of setting the stage for what I'm going to talk about going forward is I wanted to try and convince you that you know, this variation that exists between individual cells actually has information content. And if you look for the structure in it, if you look at covariation, you can actually infer things about cell states, cell circuits, and even some things about cellular biology. Uh, the problem just in thinking about all of this is that our data is super noisy. I mean, you saw my correlation before. Um, really, we want it to be much better. So what we wanted to be able to do here was to scale up, to get more than 18 cells, to get the power from having large numbers. Um, so we just had to figure out how to do it. And I'm sure you guys, in thinking about it, um, can appreciate that there's sort of two pieces that we need to solve here. The first thing is that we need to be able to prepare many cells for sequencing. And the second is we actually need to be able to pay for the sequencing, um, which is you know, actually not uh, a minor task when you start saying, I want to do thousands or tens of thousands of these things. Um, but it turns out that actually the cost of doing all of this isn't going to kill us. And that's because if we look at our gene expression estimates when we have, say, 30 million reads versus 250,000, what we see is that actually there's very little sampling bias particularly when compared to the variability that we're seeing between individual cells. So because we're actually getting good expression estimates, even at shallow depth, what we'd be best off doing here is actually sequencing you know, thousands of cells on a lane of high seq instead of just eight in most cases. And so now we just had to figure out how to prepare these. And so to make a long story short, uh, we developed some pipelines for doing this that went from cell work through our single cell processing, through library construction and sequencing, and now we can actually generate libraries at the scale of thousands of these and go from you know, cells to aligned reads in under a day. You know, one of our processing pipelines was actually developed on the C1. We were lucky enough to be early adopters and help them roll stuff out. We also do stuff in the format of multi-well plates. I'm happy to talk about when you use each and uh, what the advantages are. Um, but you know, what I want to focus on now is just, just talking a little bit about what we did with the scale. So I can lead you to what my lab works on now and tell you about the stuff that isn't published uh, that I think is really exciting. And so we have this technology. We can now do an absurd number of cells. Um, you know, we can prepare many, many libraries. So what do you do with it? Well, people come to you, and because I'm you know, a dumb physicist and I like collaborating with people, I end up working on everything underneath the sun. So I just want to give you one vignette that sort of led, where my group, uh, led the research that my group works on now. And that's focusing on how we can use this scale to think about the pathogen response in DCs. So, uh, Never have a 380 megabyte presentation. <laughs> All right, stepping back. Sorry, guys. We were here. Please do not die. All right. So I thought that this was, I thought that this was not going to crash. But I will tell you that this is the best projector I've ever seen in terms of colors. Um, so 
I can't hide behind the fact that uh, the projection is not coming through very clearly. Um, so, you know, in our first, present, in our first uh, little demonstration, what we've done is we've taken one snapshot in the dendritic cell response to LPS. Um, and, you know, we'd seen some dephasing between the cells. You know, they'd been slightly different in their timing, and that had enabled us to tease out some correlations that told us about who the cells were and how they were making decisions. But these cells actually respond to a number of different pathogenic stimuli. And um, these are dynamic responses. So here I'm showing you some population sequencing data. We're seeing some genes come on, some genes come on and go off. What I really wanted to know in looking at all of this is how is this structured? So when a gene comes on, is it that a couple cells uh, are responsible for doing that? Or is it that there's a division of labor and everybody needs to chip in a little bit to make this happen? And so it's really hard to know from a population profile. But if you have a way of doing this at scale, we can actually now go in and sequence 100 cells at every single time point when we grab a population and see how this population profile is structured. And so here's a gene expression matrix showing you uh, different time points in stimulation with a bunch of different things. It's about 1,000 cells. Um, and so as a data nerd, I think this is super awesome. Um, there's things like the emergence of cell states right here. There are rare cellular events at this point. Um, but rather than spending a lot of time geeking out over this, what I want to do is I want to tell you what we sort of learned from it and where this took me. So uh, briefly, you know, here I'm showing you uh, roughly 1,000 cells. And before, when I had 18, I found two types. So the first question you might ask is, are there more cell types? And the answer is no, um, unfortunately. It really looks like we have one cell type and the response blends together. So we sort of go from an early time point out continuously through a later time point, and our principal components map to clusters of genes that actually make sense to us. Now, just because we don't find new cell types doesn't mean that we don't find interesting and rare behaviors. So for example, if we look at the behavior of cells across this cluster of antiviral genes, what we see is that even at one hour, there's two cells that are expressing this module of genes extremely strongly. And so this uh, may not sound surprising to you, but I had always been taught canonically that this response only came on at about four to six hours um, and was something that happened in all cells. So that's super cool. Um, we have a rare event. The question is, what does it all mean? And so, you know, if you see two outliers, you say to yourself, are they outliers or are they real? So one thing we can do is we can look at the expression of these cells over other genes, other than these hundred. And what we see is on a QQ plot that they're identical to everybody else. And, you know, I'm not showing this here, but if you actually strip out the hundred genes in this cluster and redo all of your analyses, you can't actually distinguish these cells from all of the others. Um, and if you go do an orthogonal technique like FISH, we can prove that these cells actually exist one in 100, um, which, you know, is cool. And I should say for truth in advertising that we got super lucky getting two of these in 100. Um, but we recognized that we were lucky, and so we went ahead and tried to figure out what they were. So if you have two cells that sort of have this early response, the question becomes, what does that all mean? Are they just the first cells to generate this response? You know, are they the, the youngest, smartest kids in your class where you're wondering how they got here um, and why you're not them? Or is it that, you know, they're special? Are these the ones that are actually guiding the behavior? Um, you know, and it might be that that's the case. It might be that actually you need a set of cells to initiate this response, to sort of come up with the idea and propagate it. And so these are really cool ideas, uh, but they're really hard to test. Um, unless you have cool microfluidics like the C1, in which case you can actually design experiments where you can test it directly. And so what we did is we designed an experiment where we flowed cells into these microfluidic capture chambers right here. Uh, we then flowed in our LPS and let them sit for four hours. And what we looked to see is what was the response when the cells were actually isolated in these interrogation chambers, unable to talk to one another. And so if these cells are just faster, then what we're going to expect is that actually all of the cells are gonna be able to generate this response at four hours. And if not, if it's really that these guys are actually special in driving the response, then we're going to expect that on chip, this thing is going to just disappear. Make sense? Cool. So it turns out it's clear as day. These cells are actually the generals. So this is the big heat map of response that I would normally have if I had my cells in a tube and I was stimulating them. You know, it would look like this unimodal expression where all of my cells in this histogram have high levels of IFIT1. But when I put them on chip and I stop them from talking to one another, what I can see is that basically all of this heat goes away. There are a couple cells right here, which are basically like my early responders, but seem to be not responding as strong, uh, sort of because maybe they're crying out into the void alone and they don't like the fact that nobody wants to listen to them. 
But basically, what I'm seeing here is that paracrine signaling from a subset of cells is actually driving a response that I would have intrinsically thought every single cell in the population was capable of making. Um, and because we're doing sequencing, sometimes you get lucky and you get information that you hadn't actually looked for in your experiment. It just comes along for the ride. So here's a set of inflammatory genes that normally turns off in all of our cells, becomes bimodal by this time point. And what we can see is that we actually have pretty high expression in most of our cells. So it's still turned on. So what I'm really telling you is that actually what we're seeing is two coupled signaling waves. One where we have a paracrine signal turning on an antiviral gene program, and a second one where we have a, a negative regulator turning off inflammation. And so uh, this sort of leads us to these simple models like this one right here that look very good on paper but aren't actually correct. So we say things like interferon beta comes in, turns on antiviral gene expression that drives you know, all of our cells to actually turn on this gene and turns on negative regulators that turn off this other gene. But really, what we're seeing in this particular system is that we have a subset of cells that come up with an idea and secrete it, you know, have dialogue with their neighbors. That causes everybody to agree and causes feedback by another set of cells. And so that's what we're missing here. Um, and so there's a lot of things that you could take away from this, but what was most important to me um, in, sort of, in sort of the thinking about these problems, things that I've come up with and what we do now, is the idea that the microenvironment is a major influence of heterogeneity. And so this is something that probably is very obvious to everybody in the audience, but as a dumb physicist, you know, I just thought you mixed things in tubes and it all worked out magically. Um, it turns out it's not the case. But I think more conceptually, you know, what I'm telling you is that subsets of cells can have, you know, can have outsized impacts on the response of the population. So I think a lot about how you cure disease and, you know, we always think about a drug that targets a particular molecule. But maybe what we need to start to think about is the number and composition of our immune system or of different systems as a way of engineering the response that we want. And so we've worked in a lot of different systems from uh, dendritic cells to T cells to stem cells to brain tumors um, to even limb regeneration in newts. Like I said, you could basically come to me and I'd just get excited about it and I'd say, sure, it sounds like a great single cell problem, let's do it. Um, but um, what I really want to do is I want to tell you, you know, sort of what we've learned from all of these systems. Um, you know, what has it all meant when we've done all of these cells at this particular time point? So if I was asking myself um, in the context of trying to explain to somebody what we'd really learned by spending a lot of money and a lot of long nights, what I'd say is that, you know, if you weren't paying attention at all on the first point, if you fell asleep, this is the cliff notes. Um, the first thing that we learned is that the average single cell isn't always a good representation of the single cells that are in our population. That there's information in profiling these and looking at you know, how things co-vary. And you know, I focused on RNA here because we have good ways of profiling it, but really we need to look at more than RNA. We need to look at proteins, DNA, epigenetic state. We need to link all of it together to gain an understanding of how cells respond. The second quick vignette that I told you, you know, really what the takeaway from that is is that it's not even sufficient to simply think about what are the cells in the population. You have to think about who talks to who and how they communicate. You know, these intercellular circuits, not intracellular ones, uh, because they drive a lot of the dynamics. And so, you know, um, in thinking about what this all means and uh, drinking aggressively with a bunch of my colleagues, um, we came up on the back of a set of napkins with some very fundamental uh, philosophical questions that I don't think we'll ever answer, but um, it didn't stop us from writing them anyways. <laughs> So the first question that we wanted to know after all of this is, how many different cell types exist? You know, what are the different states? Um, how do you even define cell type? So that leads to the second question is, which is, what are the factors inside of a cell that cause it to respond differently under a particular stimulus? You know, this is all intracellular, but also we need to think about what's outside of the cell. So what's the role of the microenvironment, and how is that information integrated into the decisions a cell makes? But it's not only the environment, it's also the people you talk to. So what about the cells that you directly communicate with? And then finally, how does all of this integrate together at a systems level? And so we decided that, you know, in thinking about it, it would be very hard to do this in a conventional top-down approach where we took the system apart into its individual components and tried to break it down. So what we thought is maybe instead of actually going from this direction, breaking it apart into pieces, maybe we could actually build it up. So maybe we could look at our individual cells, find the different subpopulations that existed, pair them together, and then understand how all of this integrates together at a systems level. Um, and so I know this is completely insane, um, but 
one of the fun things about being an assistant professor is that you get funding and they don't tell you what you have to work on. Um, so this is what my lab is working on. And what we're really trying to do right now is we're trying to develop strategies to figure out who the cells are. So ways of doing single cell sequencing at massive scale. Ways of coupling together different pieces of information. So not just RNA, looking at proteins, post-translational modifications, epigenetic states, DNA mutations, all the kinds of things that you'd want to understand in sort of deciding why cells responded differently. But it's not only about the intracellular stuff, it's about the extracellular factors as well. So we're working on the microenvironment and on cell-to-cell -cell communication and trying to put this all in the context of what actually happens in real systems. Because you can imagine that this can sort of uh, lead to nonsense. You put together random components in different configurations and not all of them are going to build this beautiful castle that you see on the cover of a Lego box. Only certain ones work. So we're trying to figure out um, all of this. And so um, I don't understand all the biology, but we build tools. So um, for looking at single cells at scale, I'm going to, you know, we've been doing this reverse emulsion strategy for doing massively parallel single cell sequencing. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the last part of my talk. I'm going to tell you about some of the stuff that we've done now that we can get to absurd scales. Um, we're working on ways of measuring more than just RNA in our individual cells. So here's actually something that we've been doing in collaboration with Fluidime and Ulf Landegren's group at uh, SciLife Lab in uh, Sweden. And here we're actually using antibodies to couple uh, from a protein into a piece of DNA. And in that way, we can actually read out protein abundance or post-translational modifications of proteins in combination with um, the RNA from a cell. And so here I'm showing you a heat map, but this is actually expression of proteins. It's not expression of RNA. And so there's some cool stuff going on there. We're playing with microfluidics to control the uh, external environment, trying to see you know, if we basically tell the cell, um, if we give it the big brother approach where we say, this is everything we want you to do, uh, how resistant they are to it, um, and whether or not we can dictate decisions. And then we're playing with these things that I think are really cute, um, but you know, other people might not be that excited about, where we throw cells together in wells and we ask, when is the response of two cells actually different than one, um, or the sum of two individuals? So when is one plus one not equal to? Um, so with all of that laid out, let me tell you about the thing that's actually the most developed, uh, which is this idea of doing single cell sequencing at massively parallel scale. So um, I probably don't have to motivate this here, but cells are important. Um, there are lots of different cells in your body. Um, we've been trying for a very long time to figure out what the different groups are by you know, molecule structures and functions, and we group them together um, in lots of different categories. And you know, the reason that cells are so important other than that they make us up is that actually they're the machines that take mutations um, or different genotypes and turn them into phenotypes. So in order to understand you know, how genetic mutations drive autism or things like that, we need to understand the cells in which these particular mutations are active. So um, what we really want, if we think about it, is we want an atlas of cells for the body. So we want to understand what are the different types of cells that exist. What are the different states in which they can exist? What is the location of those cells? What is the transition between them? And what is the lineal relationship? And so if we think about it, you know, we've been building up this knowledge for many years, but it's only partial. Um, and some of it's you know, decades old. So if you're at the bar again and you're trying to think of big things to do, um, you might get convinced that actually you know, our single cell sequencing approaches are a great way of going after this. And the idea is that we have really good ways of you know, looking at everything that a cell's thinking. We have good ways now of preparing many, many single cells. And we have good computational algorithms. So maybe you know, we could actually imagine using these approaches to, de to define what cells are from the bottom up. And so you know, it's not insane. We started off with 18 cells back in 2012. And now, it, as of a year ago, we were already over at 100,000 cells. So maybe we could imagine scaling to the point where we could do something like this. So, could we actually do a complex tissue? Um, so you pick the most complex tissue you can, the brain. It's got 10 to the 11 cells. Um, I can't do that, just to be fair. Um, I'm sure, well, I don't actually think anybody can. Um, but you know, if you think about some subfraction of the brain, like the retina, which has 150 million neurons, and you do some back of the envelope calculations, you can convince yourself that actually, really what you'd need to do a cell type survey is about 50,000 cells. All right, so 50,000 cells is a lot. I mean, that took me over a year, um, but it seems feasible, maybe. I mean, really, actually, what I'm saying here is I'd like to do 50,000 in one experiment, which is uh, mildly insane, but that's okay. Uh, you, it's good to be ambitious. 
So what I'm really saying is that, you know, if we were to look at the number of cells on this axis and the number of genes, what I'm really looking for is something that's way out here. And so uh, I'm putting a bunch of different technologies in the context of this, and I feel like it's only fair to give a caveat as I go through this. I'm going to talk about doing sequencing at massively parallel scale in one second, uh, not to ruin the suspense. But there are technologies now that will get you up to about 1,000 cells, like Fluidime has just released a new chip. And if you were to think about it, in order to get expression estimate saturation, you need about a million reads. And so a lane of high seq is sort of equipped to handle somewhere between 200 uh, to 1,000 cells. So a bunch of technologies are actually impedance smashed. But um, let me tell you about what we're trying to do to push this a little further forward. So what I'm really looking for is a technology that's scalable, something that can do you know, 10 to 10, or 10,000 to 100,000 cells very easily, where I can sequence as many cells as I want, where I get a lot of transcripts and where it's actually cheap and easy to run these things. Uh, because it would be very hard to run 100,000 cells in the way in which we do it currently. So if we have something like this and we want to build a technology, the question becomes, what is the fundamental issue in doing all of this? So I mean, I'm sure you guys do RNA-seq preparation all the time. If you think back to what you normally do, what you would normally start off by doing is taking a set of cells. You then lyse it, and you get all of your RNA in solution. And then you come in and you capture your RNA with oligo-DT primers, either on a bead or off. The problem here is that when we lyse our cells, we actually mix all of the RNAs from our cells together. So the way that we've gotten around this in the past so that we could keep our cells separate is we either sort them into wells of a 96 or 384 well plate, so physical confinement, or we imagine doing this physically on a microfluidic chip. You know, we capture a cell, we lock it down, and then we perform all our molecular biology. Um, so what we thought is maybe we could just take this one step further. Maybe we could just encapsulate our cells in reverse emulsions, so aqueous droplets in oil, <laughs> lyse them inside of these droplets, um, and if we were clever, figure out how to get in a uniquely barcoded bead that would grab all of the RNA from the cell and magically um, turn it into cDNA so that one cell's RNA becomes covalently bound cDNA, one cell per bead. Um, now we just had to figure out how to do this. So basically what I'm proposing is that we're going to come in, take a tissue, break it apart into single cells, encapsulate cells in a droplet with a bead, reverse transcribe the RNA from one cell onto a bead so that we create these stamps, these cell, single cell transcriptomes attached to microparticles, and then generate one library. And if we have barcodes on these beads, then basically by taking this library and reading the individual uh, barcode on the front, we can tell which cell it came from. So uh, what do these magical barcoded beads look like? Well, basically, they have a PCR handle at front so we can amplify. They have a cell barcode, which is basically a social security number, um, which I was assured this morning you guys have in Australia, so I hope there aren't many blank stares. The idea is that we're going to put the same cell barcode on every single oligo that's on the surface of this bead. And in that way, um, we're basically going to tag all of the RNA from the cell during reverse transcription. And the other thing we add on is a UMI, a unique molecular identifier. And what that is is it's just a random set of eight bases. And the idea is that any two uh, oligos is very unlikely to have the same UMI. So if we capture a RNA of type A in one position and a type A in another position, we can actually tell those apart by reading the different UMIs that go with them. That roughly makes sense? So each RNA is tagged with something random. When you amplify up, you can basically figure out how many reads you have or how many RNAs you have by looking at the number of unique molecular identifiers. All right. So how do we make these things? Um, you may not be surprised to realize that you can't actually order these off the shelf. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to generate these barcoded beads, because basically they're part and parcel of what we want to do. Um, and it could have been, you know, we went after different strategies like emulsion PCR, et cetera. But at the end of the day, there was actually a very simple way of doing this. And that was to take these oligo beads, uh, these polyacrylamide beads that were used for oligosynthesis, separate out these beads into four individual chambers and do a single base synthesis. We then pull them back together, mix them about, and separate them again and do one more round of synthesis and repeat this um, six, uh, 12 times until we get 16 million different beads. What we can then do is throw all 16 million of these uh, different combinations into a tube, do eight rounds of degenerate synthesis, and at the end of the day, what we get are beads that have about 10 to the eighth primers per bead, um, and what we have are these beads that basically all contain the same cell barcode, but have all these UMIs on the end that are random. And it turns out that they work beautifully. So now what we're going to do, now that we have this bead reagent, 
is we're going to try and bring our cells in from suspension. We're going to mix them with this lysis buffer and microparticle right here, encapsulate them, mix, and hypothetically be able to hybridize our mRNA onto these beads. And so um, here's the microfluidic device that we developed to do this, uh, which actually may look complicated, but it was right off the shelf in Dave Waits' lab at Harvard. This is a co-flow device. And what we're doing is we're bringing in uniquely barcoded beads right here, which you can see occasionally. And we're bringing in cells through this channel right here. They're getting encapsulated. We go through a mixer. This causes lysis. And then we're capturing the RNA on these beads. And so then what we do is we break the emulsion, reverse transcribe. And now what we have are these beads that have cDNAs on them. And so we've actually mapped from a cell's RNA into a covalently bound cDNA. We PCR up one pool. And then we can actually prepare an ampli we can amplify and prepare a sequencing library. So what's really cool about this is that actually now we have one RT reaction, one PCR reaction, one sequencing library, but we're going to be able to get all of our information back from our reads. So just to make that clear, what we do is we do a read that looks like this. We do read one in this direction, which is 20 bases, 12 that read our cell barcode, and eight that read our UMI. And then we come back this way and do a 50 base pair read to figure out gene identity. So basically, we get a bunch of reads. We assign them to cells based upon these barcodes. And then we look for each individual gene at the number of unique molecular identifiers we count. And we get this gene expression matrix. All right? And so you know, that's great on paper. How does it work? So the experiment that we designed in order to test this was a simple one where we'd mix together some mouse cells and some human cells, throw them in, and load them. So if this device works, and it's awesome, basically imagine that I have genes in humans, genes in mouse. And what I'm going to see are a bunch of points over here where I have some unique uh, barcodes that have all mouse genes, and some up here that have all human genes, and nothing in the middle. So nothing at all. I'm, I'm not going to get any of those where I have some human and some mouse, because that would mean this thing doesn't work very well. Uh, so this is what we get. And so this is absolutely the worst thing I could have imagined, because this is exactly what I don't want. I have nothing out here, so nothing where we have a lot of human genes, nothing where we have a lot of mouse genes, and a lot of things where we have mixes. Um, so this was not very exciting. Um, we beat our head against the wall for a little while, did some changes in molecular biology. We came up with this. We played a little bit more, and eventually we came up with this. And finally, in changing a couple fundamental steps, we ended up with something that looks like this which is exactly what I wanted to see. So we have a bunch of cells right here where we have you know, a number of genes expressed in our individual cell uh, that are either human or mouse. We have a couple on diagonal, which, actually, which you actually have to get. Because the way in which we load these devices is we just load them randomly using Poisson statistics. So sometimes you are going to get doublets. But really, this isn't so bad. You know, it's a very low frequency, and we can actually drive it down even lower if we want. So now that we have data, here are sort of the specs on the system. We're getting about 95% specificity. We're getting about 7,000 genes detected, which is a little bit lower than what most people get. And we're probably at about 12% efficiency by using a couple different strategies. So not quite as good as what's there, but you know, pretty decent in a good place to actually do stuff and sort of around where we were when I did my original 18. Um, so now the question is, what could you imagine doing with the scale? Well, um, even if you just look at the cells that we used for this human mouse experiment, we can imagine using gene expression to order our cells according to their phase of the cell cycle. And we can find 200 genes that weren't, conser or that weren't previously appreciated to be involved in this process that are conserved between species. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Um, you know, but I got up here and I told you that I was going to try and do a complex tissue, and I'm showing you cell cycle. Um, so in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to try and put my money where my mouth is and show you that we can actually use this to look at very complex tissues. So here's the retina. Um, the retina is this beautiful structure with all these different cell types in it. Um, you know, in talking to some experts, they gave me estimates on numbers of different uh, types in each individual class. And there are these structures and functions. And if you go in and you look at individual cell types, like these ganglion cells, there's all these beautiful drawings of the different structures that you can get that were done back in the day by Ramoni Cajal. So the question is, can we use our sequencing-based approach to take this tissue, cellularize it, and figure out what these groups of cells are from first principles? So we use DropSeq to prepare about uh, 50,000 of these cells uh, from a mouse retina. And we sequence pretty shallowly, so about 15,000 reads per cell. And then what we tried to do is we tried to figure out what the groups were by developing some computational approaches. And so what I'm going to show you right here is our computational algorithms for actually trying to find structure in this data. So what we're doing is we're taking the best 25 cells, 
We're doing dimensionality reduction um, and then projections, projecting the remaining cells, and then trying to identify the clusters that exist, and then refining them by looking at differential expression and doing some shuffling of data. And so what you're watching is a movie as I iterate through uh, these different algorithms to try and figure out what are, the addition, what are the actual structures in this data and when they're going to stabilize. So what you're seeing is the emergence of different groups of cells, um, which could correspond to different populations. Hypothetically, we just have to validate them. And this is still going right now. Um, it just looks like it's not moving. It's a really long video, and it took six days to run on the Brogue cluster, so I'm going to let it run. Um, and what you're going to see at a certain point is it's going to stabilize. And then as we perturb it a little bit, it's going to start breathing back and forth. And we're going to get the idea that eventually it's done. Is it still running? Um, yeah. And so now it's breathing a little bit in and out. But as we perturb through this, uh, things are relatively stable. So um, that's awesome. So we have what looks like in this 50,000 cells, 39 different clusters. Um, what does it all mean? Well, before I even go forward, I think that one thing that's really cool to show in this is something that um, I hadn't appreciated before, which is actually how reproducible single cell biology is. So to do 50,000 cells, we couldn't actually do it all from one retina. So we did it on seven mice in parallel. And what I'm showing you here is the representation of each of these 39 clusters colored by the mouse that it came from. And so what you can see is that every single one of these clusters is populated by all of the mice that we used, uh, with two exceptions. Um, there's changes in the abundance of this cluster right here which is rods, um, which happens, you know, it depends upon your dissociation protocol. And the one cluster that only shows up in two of the mice is right here. Uh, it turns out that that's fibroblasts. So if you do a really sucky job in doing dissection, the computationalists will find it and they will call you out on it. Um, but I hope that at least this shows you that maybe, you know, these single cell approaches are very reproducible and what we see in populations could be changes in composition. So. I have these 39 clusters, just like I did with the original 18. We can now go in and we can identify groups of genes that define each of these individual sets, and we can start to see how they're related to one another and if it makes sense. So you get a lineage tree, um, and then you start uh, doing Google searches, and you try and figure out what every bifurcation means. So the first one that we see is neurons versus non-neurons, which makes all the sense in the world. It's a good one to see. Um, it means that maybe the data isn't bogus. We can keep on going and we see finer distinctions like photoreceptors versus retinal ganglion cells and amacrine cells. And if we actually go and annotate each of these 39 clusters and look at the number of cells from them, we can see that the numbers match what we expect from the literature and that we can find markers for each of the individual types that line up pretty cleanly. And it's not only that we're finding things that people know about. We can actually go in and look at all of these different amacrine cells right here and look at markers that uniquely define each cluster. And what we can see is that there are a couple good genes that we can find. And we can then go in and do in situ hybridizations or use transgenic mice to prove that these genes actually mark these populations. So here we're looking at MATH, a gene that defines cluster 7. And what you can see is that actually MATH does very nicely label one subset of our cells. And so this is cool. We did it for a couple different genes. But uh, for truth in advertising, it's going to be impossible to do this for everything. So if anybody has great ideas on how to iterate through this very quickly, um, in ways of labeling stuff. I have a couple, but I'm always up for talking about this because I think it's the next big challenge. What do you do with all this data? So uh, to summarize, DropSeq um, is a way of doing you know, lots and lots of scale cells very cheaply. It's not quite as good as some of the current technologies, but it enables you to work very cheaply and at a scale that you can't in other contexts. And so you know, we're really excited about the things that we could imagine doing with this. One is you know, developing the cell atlas like I laid out before. Another is looking at pathological uh, conditions, trying to understand changes in composition. Uh, we're spending a lot of time trying to use it for perturbations. So instead of doing 10,000 cells from one situation, you could imagine 100 cells from 100 different perturbations and using this as a highly multiplex readout. And then we're playing with some stuff where you can uh, use this information with markers to map cells back to positions. This is one of my coworkers' works, and this will show up soon in um, Nature Biotech. Um, and the reason I'm highlighting it is that there's a computational tool, Surat, that we used previously um, to do all of our clustering before. And that will be open source in case anybody's interested in playing with it. So just to, to close, what we've been focusing on in a lot of cases is how do we apply these technologies? How do we figure out what's missing? So one place where we've been doing this in the context of pathology is trying to understand um, the structure of tumors. So you know, going in, taking different samples, whether they're resected biopsies, fine needle aspirates, effusions, ascites, anything we can get our hands on, and trying to use these low input profiling strategies that we now know how to do at scale to actually understand what's in these samples. 
And so here I'm showing you in a bunch of melanoma cells, we can very cleanly define what the different cell types are uh, that we have. Um, we see a lot of variability in the different tumor cells that we have. And interestingly, we're also seeing a lot of variability in our different immune cells. You know, we're seeing immune cells that are exhausted, some that are still fighting our tumor cells, and some that actually are um, a little strange. And so what I'm particularly interested in coming from a physics background at this point is understanding what subtypes exist together. What immune cells exist in one region um, and what tumor cells exist in that region and what we can learn from leveraging this covariation. And so I'm just showing you the heterogeneity that exists in different structures of the tumor. And hopefully I'll have more to tell you about this soon. We have some interesting preliminary data, but it's all preliminary. Um, and so I'll just leave you with um, the things that I, as a dumb physicist, am excited about studying in these systems. So this idea of getting up to massively parallel scale, of measuring more than just RNA, getting additional pieces of metadata that we can use for our analysis, of controlling the microenvironment and interactions and trying to understand how all this comes together. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank everybody that was super instrumental in all of this work. The drops really you know, were driven by Evan Makosko from a molecular biology vantage point. He did some amazing stuff there and his uh, PI, Steve. McCarroll. Uh, Oni Basu, who's a joint postdoc between V. Vergev and Dave Waits, did a lot of the construction of the microfluidic devices, um, and none of this could have happened without her. And Jim and Rahul developed a lot of the computational algorithms, and Surat's really Rahul's brainchild, um, and will be released soon, and is an R, and is open software, and I think will be super useful. Josh Sains, our collaborator on um, the retina, uh, my technician, John, and uh, my PI for the beginning of this, Hankoon, before uh, somebody was crazy enough to let me go out on my own. Um, and I've talked about a lot of science, but I don't actually do much science anymore. So I want to thank all the people in my group who were uh, bold enough or insane enough, depending on your vantage point, to join me and to start working on stuff with me. They're all awesome. And um, I'm super collaborative, so here's who I could fit on the slide. Um, it's not exhaustive, but um, I'll just say thanks once again to all of my collaborators from the Broad um, in, and from HMS, including Evan um, and Rahul and Oni. And uh, I'll thank once again Paul and Barbara from Fluidime and Millennium um, as a way of uh, saying thank you for giving me the opportunity to come speak here. And thank you guys all for listening. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, pretty cool. Any questions for the dumb physicist? <laughs> Ken. Yeah, wonderful stuff. Thank um, you. Question about the extent of variation you found in your original population, which I assume were basically monocyte derived type of dendritic cell. Mm -hmm. Those in particular we now think of being particularly plastic mm -hmm. type of cell that mm -hmm. takes on different forms in different tissues. Mm -hmm. So the issue is whether this that extent of variation is characteristic of a particular flexible cell type as opposed to, say, a particular T cell that might have a more fixed function or a different type of dendritic cell that doesn't stay this. So how general is that? It seemed like you're having so, clustering with the retinal cells. So super general is the, is the answer. Um, so there are places where you don't see it, places where the variation is less robust. The immune system is one place where you do see a lot of variation. It makes a lot of sense to me. You're trying to use a limited number of components to you know, encode a bunch of responses and you're trying to have feedback. Um, but in the context of dendritic cells, you know, we do see a tremendous diversity in their ability to respond. We also see it in T cells. So, you know, we've done a lot of stuff in single cells uh, with T cells. And actually, these canonical types like Th1, Th2, it really doesn't mean much. You're seeing a bunch of plasticity between them and they change back and forth. It seems to me to be more of something that's, uh, you know, pan immune system in the stuff that we've done so far. Um, and we haven't looked at all cells exhaustively, but there definitely are a number of different uh, types. And um, the microenvironment plays a huge role in it. Um, and we're only starting to scratch the surface. The dendritic cells we did here, I wouldn't even really call dendritic cells. They're not even monocyte derived. They're um, dendritic cells from bone marrow. So basically, we differentiate bone marrow in the presence of GMCSF for nine days, and we select them out. So it's sort of a precursor cell, but they recapitulate a lot of the TLR signaling pathway, which is why we originally looked at them. When we do conventional DCs, like the different subsets you would find, we actually get very nice separation. That's something I can show you on my computer where you will get different clusters. But we do find cells that actually emerge that we wouldn't have expected, like we found a rare uh, precursor population. But they are actually very distinct. Um, so, so if you were to look at the dendritic cell type sorted based upon the markers you know, it would look a lot more like what I showed you in the retina, uh, just for truth in advertising. 
Yes, you should. I am really nice to my question. Are you able to apply this like, technique to a population skill in humans to predict the views? So I have absolutely no clue yet how this will all work out in humans when we go up to scale. But we, you know, one of the hats that I wear is um, I, I have an affiliation in a lab at the Reagan Institute that's focused on sort of engineering the immune system. It does a lot of stuff around HIV and tuberculosis. We're sort of interested in looking at the population, you know, the single cell response to a bunch of these different pathogens, how it changes over time, what it looks like in individual cohorts or, you know, in individual patients versus others. And I'm very excited about doing that. Um, but I can't promise you that it's all going to work and I don't have the data yet to say that really there's going to be everything that will be there. But I'm sure there'll be some interesting stuff. There's no reason you can't apply it. Ian? I thought it was really interesting when you showed through some of the technical experiments that in some cells you'd expect, you see you know, 30,000, 40,000 transcripts, and then for the vast majority of them, you see you know, closer to 1,000 or 2,000. Like, how much of that is technically driven in terms of how many reads you got for that individual sample versus do you really have these cells that have massively diverse transcripts versus those that have more simple? So there are, there's two confounding issues there. One is biological and one is technical. Technically, the protocol is relatively, you know, the range of efficiencies is relatively the same. What changes a lot is the biology of the cells. The health of the cell contributes, but the major factor in defining the number of genes we see on that axis is the type of cell. Rods, for example, in the context of the retina have much less RNA than something like, you know, a, um, a retinal ganglion cell. So we're seeing differences there. And then when we're within cell lines, it's differences in efficiency of capture. Um, and you know, we're trying to work on that. Sometimes actually some things that are way far out on the axis. If you remember, I showed some stuff that clustered right about here. And I showed a couple points out here. So I showed you doublets that come up on the diagonal right here. Some of these outliers on this edge as well are doublets. They're just doublets of the same cell type. And not surprisingly, you get about you know, 1.3 or 1.4 times as much RNA um, out of those cells. Or doubles. I guess the other question I have is, is you, do you go on also to look, I guess, with time, like dynamically, like how stable is a state in an individual cell? Can you actually address that? So it's super hard. I, I mean, that's one of the biggest questions that I think about all the time these days. And one of the reasons that we think about measuring multiple different things. So I threw up this slide, but one of the things that I sort of ignored in all of this, going back here, is that one of the major variables that we want to look at is time. So I showed you proteins here, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out ways of mapping previous cellular states. Because doing you know, a, I have a snapshot here, a snapshot here, a snapshot here, and proving that you move through a specific trajectory is super hard. Um, and that's why I get excited about barcoding experiments and about imaging experiments. But I think there are also ways to go after this um, that we've been pursuing in the context of synthetic biology, so creating molecular reporters of previous events. So things where we sort of get a yes no question, did this cell have this transcription factor? Was it exposed to this? My hope is that by adding those together, you know, sort of this molecular questionnaire that goes with our phenotype, that we'll be able to trace trajectories and sort of understand lineage relationships and links between different cell states. But I mean, it's super hard. Um, we, can, we can basically guess and then we can go back and test them. So for example, our early responders, the way we figured out what they were was we looked at genes that were negatively correlated with the cluster. Um, we saw that there was a transcription factor, or sorry, chromatin regulator CBX4. So we thought that maybe they were in a different epigenetic state. And if you perturb CBX4, you get a massive explosion of cells turning on this uh, antiviral program, which suggests to us that actually that's how it's getting set up. Now, how you get a set of cells, or just the right percent of cells that are going to respond at any given time point, um, I could hypothesize about all night, but it's super cool to think that somehow. The system is setting up just the right number of these cells at any given time point so that you get robust responses. Yes? With the low number of transcripts you're getting with the cell in the later experiments, were there uh, genes with canonical lineages which you never saw coming through? In those populations? Oh, sure. So I think that, I think that we, we miss things all the time. So there are two ways that you get power in single cells. One is you get it through having lots of cells, and the other is by getting clusters of genes. So we see things drop out all the time. So there are genes where you would say this is canonical TH17, like IL-17A, completely disappears um, in some of our cells. It's just not there. It could be failed detection. It could be there was a burst and we didn't get it. But if you look at genes that are in that pathway, we can see that there's actually coordinated movement. And so even though we don't have one particular transcript, we can see that there are a bunch of transcripts that are expressed that represent that lineage. And so basically, we look for uh, you know, 
we look at how genes behave across clusters that either we've annotated or haven't annotated, go back and figure out if there are enrichments, and use that as a way of gaining insight into what's driving the variability in our system. And uh, for that computational algorithm that I talked about, there's actually a very nice way of imputing uh, what gene expressions should be for a given gene based upon the other genes around it, which is sort of like GWAS. And so Rahul's done some really nice stuff so that you can actually fill in data matrices um, to guess what expression should have been even though it wasn't. I think we might leave it there for lack of time. Um, a lot of people here are, in, are getting more interested in single cell, so we really appreciate you taking the time out to give us a bit of insight into your work. Thanks very much, Alex.